Hello, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, but uh, uh, whatever uh, time is in, in, in the place you are listening to us, uh, we are here, I'm Monica Bello, and uh, in the other screen is Gertrude Stoker. Hello. We are uh, really happy to be part of this uh, FASIL festival. Um, I'll, I'll start by introducing Geoffrey, is that, if that's fine with you, Geoffrey, um, and, and then I'll say a few words about myself as well. Uh, Geoffrey, uh, you are coming from Austria in Linz, I'm a, a media artist and engineer from, uh, for communication technology. You have been uh, artistic and managing director of Arts Electronica since 1995. Uh, around that time, uh, you developed the groundbreaking exhibition strategies for the Arts Electronic Center, that is today one of the landmarks in the city in Linz, with a small team of artists and technicians and uh, as responsible for the setup and the establishment of Arts Electronica's own uh, research and development facility, the fantastic uh, Arts Electronica Future Lab. Uh, uh, Arts Electronica has as well an exhibition, uh, international exhibitions uh, uh, division. Um, um, I can see as well in your biography that the planning and the revamping of the contents of the Arts Electronica Center occupied part of your time. And, uh, and this was enlarged in 2009. Uh, with the opening in 2015, right, of the Arts Electronica Center. Well, may, maybe maybe we can talk about this later. And um, you've been a consultant for numerous companies and institutions in the field of creativity and innovation man management, and a very active and a proactive guest <laughs> lecturer and in international conferences. In my side, I'm coming. Uh, I'm a Spanish curator. I'm based in Geneva, sometimes in Barcelona, where my family is. Today, I'm connecting from Madrid. And um, since 2015, I'm uh, running and directing the arts program of the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva. This is CERN. It's the largest laboratory dedicated to fundamental physics in, in Geneva and one of the leading organizations for uh, open uh, science and understanding of science for, that brings value to society. So uh, let's start off uh, by uh, thinking what happened uh, in the last year. Um, I know, um, well, Ars Electronica is an important event uh, for us, for the whole community, but also uh, not just in the art, but also in the research, students, uh, innovators, startups, companies, and it happens in Linz every year. Every year in September, we mark in our calendar and uh, we take a fly, usually a, <laughs> a train from Vienna, and we, many of us, uh, end up um, uh, spending a week in, in, in this vibrant environment, which is Ars Electronica. However, in 2020, uh, for obvious reasons, this uh, gathering of uh, creativity didn't happen. Uh, what was really uh, thrilling for all of us is that you quickly, your, you and your team quickly react to the conditions of the pandemic that didn't allow us to do this, uh, uh, mobility and traveling, and you invent something called Kepler's Garden with uh, 120 locations worldwide, bringing the community together in uh, a moment, uh, exceptional circum circumstances where we need to reinvent ourselves. Uh, tell us a bit about this, because I think it was an iconic moment during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. And it's really great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you here for, for some audiences, because we had so many chances already in both of our careers to collaborate uh, 
Art and Science, which is a super important topic for us, electronic is also uh, the basis of your work and uh, the stuff that you are doing in particular now with CERN, but for many, many decades before, I think is really uh, uh, astonishing and uh, it's really a great pleasure to have you here as a partner to talk about this. Coming to this, you know, uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, challenging moment of pandemic suddenly closing down all our lives. Uh, it, of course, like basically for everybody else, it has been really a dramatic uh, moment for us electronic. I mean, in particular, the festival, as you described, has been growing in these uh, last years to a really huge event. Every year it uh, uh, attracted more audiences, more uh, artists, more partners. As Electronica Festival in 2019 uh, had more than 100,000 visitors in a small city with about 200,000 visitors. So I think that shows uh, quite well also the international attraction that uh, the festival gained. And another remarkable number was that actually 57 universities from all over the world were coming with teachers and students to participate in the presentations of the festival. So they were coming to exhibit their projects, uh, coming to uh, participate and contribute to the program. And I mentioned this just uh, not only because, of course, I'm proud about this, this is clear, but also to give a kind of sense of this really super dramatic and steep uh, decline of possibilities that we were suddenly facing. And uh, for us, of course, uh, like probably for, for most of, of other cultural organizations, the big question was anyway, will we be able to sustain our activities? Should we shut down completely or should we go into the risk of planning and preparing a festival that might not be able to happen if the uh, pandemic is just uh, growing and getting worse? And uh, I mean, basically, we did the obvious, which at this time, of course, everybody was contemplating and trying in our communities of uh, digital art and digital culture is basically to putting our theories at test, because we're all talking in, in our festivals and activities since decade about this online community and what it means to be uh, con uh, to have people only connected uh, by digital means. I mean, there's thousands of artworks in all these last decades that have been exploring this. But nevertheless, in organizing a festival, we all were still working very uh, traditional because a festival is by its nature in our understanding is people coming together, having um, yeah, a great time together, exploring things together, developing things together. And so the decision to go online was of course clear. But for us, the very important point uh, at, at this moment of time was to make sure that we are not going online in the way of broadcasting where we would say, okay, usually you all come to our festival. Oh, sorry, you cannot come. So we are streaming our content to you. I think this was a very interesting to see in this early time of the first big lockdown that many organizations, whether it was universities, entertainment or art and culture, were just resorting to this idea, okay, my content is what is important. So I stream my content and then uh, the people on the internet will anyway just be happy to receive the content, which shows a lot. And, and, and I'm a little bit uh, ironic about this, of course, shows a lot uh, the way how we all work. I mean, working in culture is, as we know, very often a kind of also autistic, self-centered uh, uh, type of work, which is necessary because we need to focus our energy uh, to, to work in this field. And so what for us, uh, what became more and more important was to, to look at the strengths of the real physical Ars Electronica Festival, which was, as I mentioned before, to be a platform. In this more than 40 years of its development, Ars Electronica already since very long time has moved from just being a content creator and producer to a platform that was um, hosting more and more uh, programs also from other activities, from other festivals, as I said, from uh, universities and of course many, many individual artists, which was the natural development of the whole uh, 
bus of digital transformation. I mean, the, the enormous avalanche of interest into digital culture, into all the topics related uh, to the digital transformation, created a situation where the festival anyway had to transform to be a platform. And uh, where it was much more powerful to say, okay, what we want and how we can serve also our communities is much more by being a platform and networking all these super interesting people all over the world. And this is actually what uh, what we what we then uh, went on uh, to do. So the, the 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 point was that from the very beginning we announced that we want to do this festival as a network with all uh, uh, with as many as possible partners. At the end, it was actually more than 160 who participated, and we only had one rule, so to say, because basically we were trusting that these partners would be experienced and responsible enough to put up good program. And actually, for me, it was really the point, it was more important to be connected than what kind of you know, artistic project everybody would present. Because in this moment of time where we all were isolated, it was, of course, clear and obvious. The most important thing is keeping up the connection in a field like uh, art and culture, but also in, in the scientific field. We really totally depend on this constant stream and flow of exchange and ideas and conversation and discussions and, of course, also conflicts that are arising about it. So this was the main idea. And we said, OK, everybody should do something real with real artists, with real projects and real audiences within the location that uh, they have available. No matter how small it is, invite two people into your garden and talk with them about uh, the topics of uh, our digital culture. It's fine, you are part of it. And I think some really were as small like this, that only a few people were gathering, but others uh, immediately put all their resources they had and really created really strong, big, so to say, parallel festivals. And the interesting point was then sometimes, I think, by end of May last year, so about one and a half, two months after we started this, we recognized that a dynamic had been unfolding that was so strong that even if, you know, here in Linz, we would have had to shut down completely for whatever reason. It was clear the festival will take place even without us. And this was a really exciting moment to see that there is such a dynamic that can actually really so say, be a strong opposition and can fight even against things like these lockdowns uh, and pandemics. And I mean, to make this anyway, much too long story uh, short, the result was just uh, exciting. And it was immediately clear for us that this is a new dimension uh, for our festival. And I think in general, for uh, uh, this whole area of uh, cultural exchange, in particular in the, in the, in the area of uh, digital arts and culture. And also for this year, of course, we are preparing to have uh, actually the much larger part of our festival again in a network uh, with uh, many, many gardens all over the world. And another super nice experience was, of course, that we suddenly could reach out to people who most of them wouldn't have been able to travel to Linz because of financial reasons or whatsoever. I mean, students from very remote countries who usually don't have the means to uh, hop into a plane and spend uh, a week in Linz, they were not only watching, so to say, a kind of secondary level of festival by you know, getting some spillover on the internet. They were, because of this nature of this online platform, they suddenly could be really part of it, being all together in the center of it. And of course, I don't have to mention how difficult it was, uh, how many technical troubles we had to overcome and solve and how exhausted all our teams were. But it was really a, an, an amazing experience that gave us also a lot of energy to uh, so keep on going through these difficult times of the uh, lockdowns. Of course, uh, Geoffrey, you uh, and uh, the whole team of Arts Electronica are uh, not uh, uh, unfamiliar to what a system means. Uh, what mm -hmm. is a system? You are a system, a platform that uh, brings a really rich tissue that has a 
uh, scale that is global and local at the same time. And I think for me, that is what is um, yeah, outstanding about your rapid response mm -hmm. of the, uh, to the pandemic and the conditions that obviously didn't allow to, to, uh, to, to, to bring us to Linz. But I, I, think, I think this is the nature of Fars Electronic and many other um, small or bigger uh, organizations uh, or um, initiatives that uh, understand technology at the philosophical level. And, uh, and I, think, I think this is part of the conversations of the Ars Electronica in the, in the symposium, in the festival uh, over the years. And, and, um, and then of course, there is this other side, which is nurturing a community. The engagement needs to go into different directions and the voices are multiple, the multidimensionality of culture is something clear to me in everything you do. And in fact, uh, by, um, when I was preparing this conversation, I kept, uh, yeah, I, I enjoy a lot because uh, I came, came back to the beginning of my career when I was very interested in art and science because I'm an art historian, but I always kept an eye on what science was doing because that uh, and technology that was transforming our society and was urgent for us to see how this th transformation happened. And perhaps as well, uh, related to the pandemic, um, we have realized over the years we, that this system was a uh, trans-species uh, system. It was not mm -hmm. only about humans or technology or the things, uh, the, the prospects uh, into the future, what these technological devices and scientific advancements were giving us uh, uh, as tools, but also the transformation inside us, uh, the nature of uh, humans and how we understand our planet. And in the pandemic, we heard um, uh, notions, uh, phenomenon of such as uh, zoonosis or, or a phenomenon uh, that were happening in our atmosphere that influence the spread of deadly virus that were not new to us. It should have not been new to us, but they were suddenly uh, a topic for discussion in the general public, with, uh, within the general public. So, um, so going back to my research into, into the archives of Ars Electronica, I found in, well, I think maybe I'm wrong, I think it's the 1998, Life Science. 1999. 99, George <laughs> Jesset, uh -huh. uh, pioneering uh, bio art, uh, told us already at that time that it, he wanted to imagine an art that uh, sp helped to spread the, the message that we were part of nature. Mm -hmm. And our responsibility in nature passed by um, understanding the other species as ourselves. So we, this communion in nature at that time was very important for him. 20 years later, or more than 20 years later, we know that this is a big mm -hmm. compromise. We need to compromise on, on this. Uh, so what is your reaction to, to this yeah, uh, retrospective approach of what George has yeah. said at this yeah. time, at that time, and where we are now, yeah. are we convinced? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a super interesting topic that that you are pointing out, and I mean, especially when we look at this idea that we have to reconsider ourselves as part of a system, as part of one of the the wheels in a complicated mechanism. It's really incredible to see how many artists are now really focusing their work on this. We have this pre Ars Electronica every year. Uh, this year we got about 3,200 submissions from all over the world again. And it's really significant to see every year by 
watching what uh, the artists are presenting, what kind of works they are submitting to this uh, award competition, how certain trends are really emerging and then becoming from a trend, uh, they really uh, uh, coming from a trend, they are really going into a very serious uh, area of work. And this whole idea of understanding this interspecies communication, understanding the problems of our time as a problem because we are not enough aware of how delicate this intrinsic uh, interwoven network of our, uh, of our world is, whether it's the economic, the technical, the human, social, or of course the very big uh, global dimension. And I think it's super interesting because in, in, in your reference to, to George Gessert from, from 1999, it shows again, you know, one of the things I always have been most excited of working uh, with uh, this contemporary field of art and technology, art and science people, is to really see how visionary they are. We could, when you look, and, and I mean, Ars Electronica is now running since 42 years. So it's, a, it's of course, a rich opportunity to go back into the archives. Mm -hmm. And no matter which catalog you open, you find really, you know, stunning examples where you say, okay, basically, this quote or this sentence from, from this abstract could be actually uh, from today or from this year or even from, from only from last year or something. And seeing this very long-term vision of artists is a really a, a, a incredible uh, point. And um, on this, I think one, one that, that it's really a pity that we as a society and in particular our big decision makers in politics and so on, do not really listen to artists. I mean, if when we look at you know how artists have been in the 80s already, pretty clearly describing the development of internet into social media with all the problems that we have right now. I mean, lo listening, looking and listening to the work of artists in the 80s could have solved us many, many problems that we have right now uh, with our uh, digital societies. And the same thing is, of course, even more so true when we uh, uh, think about this uh, important and delicate issue of uh, how to deal uh, with our environment. I mean, the the dramatic visibility of climate change and of course also the growing awareness has of course uh, led to a much uh, stronger presence of this topic in the work of artists. And I think we have a very interesting, so there's a series of events or in the development. I mean, of course, again, from our point of view, uh, it started very much with the upcoming uh, of the internet, the networked uh, possibilities. The moment when this computer technology went out of the factory halls and laboratories of the industry and became a public part of society, uh, everyday part of society and culture. This created a new understanding of what systems actually could mean. And I think in all these uh, topics, it is one thing to think about it or even to write about it in your papers or your books or lectures. And the other thing is then experiencing it in real life and in particular experiencing such developments in the scaling of a broad public attention. And this is something we see very clearly with uh, the, the rising of, of the internet and, and then coming this whole uh, trend of the uh, social media. And suddenly all these ideas that we are in a new dimension of how public opinions are created and organized, how we are communicating on a global scale. Suddenly it was real. It was no longer just a vision. Suddenly it was real. And I think the same thing is happening now very much with uh, this uh, um, introduction of uh, environmental issues on concerns into uh, the contemplation into the way how uh, people, artists, theoreticians uh, think about uh, this present development. There is, of course, the very big next moment that was at the end of the 90s, the Human Genome Project. And when we say, okay, you know, we have 89, uh, Tim Berners-Lee starts the World Wide Web and suddenly something that was already there 
the internet was there for uh, 20 years already. But of course, this moment brought the internet. It's, it's like when you have a flower, the flower is already there, even when it's just a little uh, 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 green uh, harm. But then at a certain moment, it explodes, it becomes visible. It expresses itself. And then 10 years later, uh, 99, we have almost uh, finished uh, the first human genome project. Uh, we had Dolly, the first cloned mammal and sheep. And suddenly there was a completely new topic that was also creating a new perspective and a new uh, attraction. And in the time since, what we have seen is more and more integrating and coming of these things together. Whether it's in the real scientific world, I mean, we have uh, bioinformatics and all these kind of things that you can now study even at universities in many places of this world. Uh, and we have, of course, in particular in the world of uh, artists, uh, a really wonderful generation now of much younger artists than, than George Gessert, who was one of the pioneers, of course, who are very fluently changing between the world of art and science, who have no problems to collaborate in a serious level together with uh, bioengineers uh, uh, and, and, and also people in, in, in commercial uh, biology laboratories or in, in, in academic ones. And this has really created a wonderful wells of super important works that I think definitely help us as a society at large again to better understand that we need to look in all these directions. We probably never will be able as humans to not see ourselves as the center of the world. I mean, that's so deep in our probably evolutionary condition. This is, um, but what we have to become more and more able. And I think this is what these art projects are really helping us to understand and to develop, is that even if we see ourselves as the center of the world, we have to turn around, we have to get at least a kind of 360, three-dimensional view of our world. And I think that's absolutely necessary because in practical senses, without technology and science, which belongs to the you know, greatest things that humanity ever developed, I mean, it is exciting. I mean, you are working at CERN. It's, I mean, we're always wondering, you know, wow, the pyramids in, in Egypt, how did they build this? Imagine in thousand years, somebody digs up CERN and discovers the, the huge apparatus there. I mean, it's like, it's, it, it's the, the, the world wonders of our time. So science is one of the strongest and most fascinating things that humans are able uh, to do. And we need these capabilities to solve the very big problems that we have. But we will only be possible to need, the, uh, to, to use these capabilities that we have when we are able to integrate them and when we are able to get this 360 uh, degree point of view. And I think this is uh, one of the pivotal and most important role of arts uh, in this I mean, art has many roles, and we could, of course, discuss for hours just to define what art is or what it's not. Uh, but among the many possibilities, I think this is a very important one. Art is helping us to open up our mind, to see different directions, to have a more, uh, a wider and, and broader view of the things, and to be more receptive and open to also integrate other positions in our way of thinking. And I think if this is uh, something that we can support uh, in the future, um, then we probably have a chance to, to, to deal and, and, to, and to cope with these very big uh, issues. And I'm always uh, the optimistic type. I mean, there's this very nice <laughs> quote that said, it's too late to be a pessimist. So uh, <laughs> let's try to use all the capabilities that we have to get out of these dilemmas that we are in. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the quote of um, uh, our director, uh, Fabiola Gianotti. In 2018, she said in, in Davos, in the conference in Davos, that uh, she was very much in favor of a diverse and multidisciplinary culture because uh, when we think that, um, that art and science are in compatible and mutually exclusive, we are wrong. And, uh, and she continues saying that uh, we need to break cultural silos because 
Um, both are the highest expressions of creativity, ingenuity, curiosity, and uh, of humanity. And I think I think this is um, this is always in my mind uh, when when I work with the artists at CERN, but also. I keep thinking, and uh, maybe maybe you can react to that, that um, in isolation, uh, disciplines uh, have huge limitations. In isolation, as disciplines, but also as individuals. So uh, what I learned from CERN is that um, if we are in, we have reached this point in which uh, the Large Hadron Collider is running and telling us somehow what happens at the highest level of energy, uh, that we can reach at the moment uh, is, is because science is a massive collective effort. And, uh, uh, and another uh, way to prove this, which is more tangible, closer to us, is the, the, the development of uh, vaccines. In, in, in just a few months, we have several vaccines and people are getting vaccinated for this disease now. So, um, but then going back to the art side, I also think that there is huge limitations when you see art in isolation or when you are an artist and you, you, you don't see the porosity in, in this huge system. So um, I have this artist who came to San Nathan with and, uh, uh, and he told me um, that the reason why he wanted, one of the reasons uh, uh, why he wanted to come to San is because he wanted to see his work with the eyes of others, mm -hmm. with, the, uh, with, with the eyes of other discipline. And, uh, uh, and this was a, a really important moment for me because it, when we think of art and science like two values that you need to find the balance, it's not. It, it's just an ecosystem that needs to keep interacting with each other. So these signals become uh, um, in bridge somehow. Mm -hmm what you do and uh, spread and expand uh, all the possibilities or also uh, uh, brings yeah, more value or yeah, tells you that you are failing and th this direction is perhaps uh, there is another way to do things. So it's, it's, it's about yeah, understanding things dy dynamically. And um, what do you think? What, <laughs> I, I mean, this is kind of, uh, fundamental to me. <laughs> I, I think that the, the great point is that we are finally, I think, getting really to a very good understanding of uh, the, the, the nature of this art science collaboration. Also, what we can expect, what we should expect, how to conduct it. I mean, there has some been so much interesting work and experiments and what you are doing at CERN is definitely one of the, the leading you know, uh, icons of this. Uh, and I think in the beginning, it was very much always this idea that you bring these experts together and one plus one makes two or maybe even three, <laughs> even better. And it was very much, so to say, product and result focused. Uh, in particular, when funding organizations came in. I remember many uh, discussions with people in Brussels, uh, and they were eager to support uh, art science, art technology collaboration, but always asking, yes, and how can we quantify the success and the output? And of course, it's, it's natural, that's their way of thinking. But of course, it's on the other side, uh, you couldn't be more wrong than, than looking this way it is. I think both, and this is of course a dramatic simplification saying it like this, but both art and science are probably the only areas in our life, in our world, where you can be wrong, where you can fail with something. Because in art, it's anyway, there is no right and wrong. In art, you never can prove what is right and wrong. I mean, maybe in hundreds of years, the art market can say, if you earn more than 100 million for a, for a painting, then it's, a, it's the right one or the wrong. But this is all stupid. And in science, at least since, yeah, also more than 100, 120 years or so, uh, we have established a very strong culture of falsification. Proving that things are wrong is much more important in many cases than just coming up with uh, a right answer. And I think in times like this that we are facing right now, and it's really the culmination. I mean, we have this digital transformation that is still a huge challenge to our uh, societies and even growing. We have 
not only ahead of us, we are already in the midst of uh, uh, the climate crisis and the climate uh, catastrophe that is probably uh, looming ahead of us. And then we have now this pandemic, like a, like a looking glass, it's like a burning glass. Suddenly the pandemic has really shown us how vulnerable and sensitive uh, uh, our, our world actually, or our position actually is. And in this moment, I think what we see is that a realm in which experts can seriously deal with questions that cannot be answered is a very important thing because in our totally rationalized world, we are used to that questions are here to get an answer. That's what it is. And I mean, again, even if you might know it, so to say, theoretically, it's easy to talk about, it's easy to write about it, but then to create a working environment for people from very different disciplines, and of course, art and science have many things in common, but they are also clearly separated. That's why we call the one art and the other science. That's a, that's a very uh, a clear thing. So to, to create a working environment where people from these very different realms with different language, with different evaluation systems and all these kinds of things, where they can work together and bring the strongest asset they have to full fruition, which is asking questions that cannot lead necessarily to an answer that probably maybe never will will uh, get an answer this is creating this energy that radiate radiates out from these places of art and science into uh, the larger society this is the, the real benefit the benefit is not the products that come out this is stupid to expect this I mean, why should, when artists work with scientists for a few months, why should they suddenly, you know, invent a completely different world? But what they are doing is creating an atmosphere and the an energy. It's really like a reactor that is creating energy and then radiating it uh, out into the world. And I think um, we need people, people like uh, Fabiola Cianotti. I mean, she is just wonderful in terms of making these things possible because that's actually the only thing you can do. You have to put yourself in a position of serving the needs that this kind of collaboration can happen. And I think if this is done right, come back to another point that you said about the disciplines and the silos in, in science and in particular in academic uh, uh, world. Of course, the silos are a very big problem, but on the other side, they are also a super efficient means to excel within the very high expectations and challenges of your disciplines. So it's not about creating a situation where we, oh, let's get rid of our silos and disciplines and everybody being happy. It's about creating a situation where you allow and support people being totally focused and specialized in their field, but then finding means to push them out from their corridor mm -hmm. and allow them. And sometimes you have to force them to open up uh, their minds and their, their attentions. And that's not easy for both sides. I mean, artists as well as scientists are working in a very competitive environment. If you don't produce your papers and your credits in science, I mean, even if you think you are doing a super nice job, you won't get very far. And the same thing is with arts. If you are not producing new performances, concerts, uh, installations, paintings, whatsoever, I mean, you are not getting very far. So we have to provide ways that are really beneficial for both sides, art and science, to succeed in their careers but also to allow them uh, or sometimes force them to really uh, leave their corridors and, and, and meet together in some uh, imaginary spaces where they can uh, work together, inspire each other, and by this inspiration really create this energy that I was uh, trying to talk about that is the real benefit for society. Hmm. I think, I think uh, we will keep doing things <laughs> because we need to <laughs> pay our bills, but because we have the these pools, this impulse to uh, to keep asking ourselves uh, where are the limits, right? And uh, uh, a, a very uh, a regular question that I uh, I ask my my colleagues scientists at CERN is uh, what are the limits? Where is the frontier for you in science? Of course, it's kind of obvious. 
uh, after a while what the answers are. But uh, I recently asked uh, Wolfgang Lerke, uh, theories, what are the limits for you? And he thought, uh, he said, uh, cosmology, uh, complexity, neurology, the brain, right? Uh, and, and then uh, thinking about this, I remember in 2007 with my colleague Ula Taipale, uh, we curated a, a project that, in fact, we try to ask ourselves these questions as curators. Uh, and, and this project called Neurotica because you keep thinking and you keep thinking, you never have the answer. I, 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 today I think it's a silly name, but the topics were biology, bio, the body, Mm -hmm. ecology and the environment, and uh, the other, otherness. Where is the other? Yeah. I, at that time, I was really thinking about um, what did we are seeing today. Uh, 700 kids uh, swimming to cross from Morocco to Ceuta, and how we see them, mm -hmm. uh, like the otherness, or yeah, the migration of animals to rare places, so this otherness that we don't uh, understand how to capture this. And uh, so my question is for you, what are the frontiers? Where mm -hmm. should we be looking at? Where, where yeah. is the limit that we don't see the horizon even? Yeah. I like very much the otherness. I think this is the one I would uh, immediately agree with in, in, in so many terms. I mean, this is, in, you know, in, in a very deep individual uh, question of our human nature, this is the the main question that we have in terms also of frontier where we never will reach a conclusion. We will never have a definite answer because every moment you are able to expand your knowledge of the world to get acquainted with other things than the ones you know already and you think about. Well, it's just a little step forward and it's the next frontier, the next frontier, the next frontier. This, this is definitely an, an unlimited uh, question. And I think it's the most important because the other is also the question of togetherness. Only if I understand, find a way how to deal with the fact of otherness, whether it's in the very close local community of living together with people or in the global sense, whether we are dealing with the enormous challenge of uh, uh, refugees and, and migrations. Uh, and I mean, we have to be aware what we are seeing right now is just a short glimpse, a small glimpse of what is ahead of us, the pressure to all those poor people will become so much bigger in the coming 10, 20 years with, uh, the <coughs> sorry, with the increase of uh, the effects of climate change. Uh, and I think also with the increase of our total ignorance that we still have here in our Western industrialized rich world, or however you might call this. I mean, just a matter of fact that we are still discussing whether we should waive uh, patent rights on uh, uh, corona vaccines. It, 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 there's nothing you can say about this anymore. This is, I think, uh, what, what else could prove how ignorant we are. Uh, and I think it's also in, in many other levels. What I was mostly interested when we started to work with the festival in the topic of artificial intelligence was actually, uh, that's why we, we called it also AI, another I. So to use also these uh, scientific technological uh, um, tools and possibilities to reflect on what does it mean to be me in the mirror of these technological systems. Because dealing with the other is of course always uh, something that means dealing with me myself. And only if I'm able to create, so to say, a dialogue, a functioning dialogue between the way how I position me and myself, I can really deal uh, with the otherness. And I think what you also addressed before, this necessity to see ourselves as a part of a system, of an ecosystem, and that we have to really see this triangle of human technology and nature as, so to say, the, the, the field of possibilities, the field of activities that, that uh, we have available. This has very much to do with this uh, super important question.
And of course, you could easily extend this into spiritual and uh, religious dimensions as well, where we clearly see that uh, many of these uh, ways how uh, religion is helping humans and humanity to cope with everyday life has to do with helping them to establish a relationship between me, myself, and the rest of the world. There is this very nice saying uh, that if you want to, to talk mean about people, uh, then you say, you know, when he was born, he had to face this serious problem that there were already other people before him on this planet. <laughs> so I think this uh, kind of ironic approach is very nice. This is uh, uh, really one of, in, in the center point, I think, of, of humanity. Yeah, that's, that's, that's I, I, I totally agree with you. I think I, uh, we talk, uh, a lot, and uh, and in, in in Spain we have yeah politicians that uh, the the new politics talking about the politics of care, and for a few years we've been thinking about this caring about the other. And I, mm-hmm. I, I think they are very right, and uh, and I hope they manage to to find the, a way to to bring that into society. But yesterday I was um, in fact talking ab- uh, about the care, the curing, the empathy with uh, Oriana Persico and Salvatore Iaconesi that you probably know uh, their work mm-hmm. because they've been in, in, in Ars Electronica several times. And they, uh, in, in the conference that we were um, uh, coinciding, uh, they were talking about a new social deal, a new social deal about empathy, about finding ways and tools and uh, um, based in technology as well, how technology would help us to be more together. So this idea of togetherness is, is uh, definitely crucial. So uh, perhaps my question or my reaction to the, the, the topic of Ars Electronica this year, the new digital deal, which is really a manifesto, um, is, is uh, what, what do you expect from that? Because perhaps if I go back to the, you know, 32 years ago, I, I, I can wonder um, what Tim Berners-Lee thought uh, when he wrote this uh, paper, uh, management protocol, uh, a proposal and handed to his boss mm-hmm. and say, hey, we need to make something with all this data. What do, what do we do? Was that part of this, yeah, um, taking care of something that was growing too far and we could lose control easily? Is, is the new digital deal going to this direction, how we can stop and do something and take and, and care for it? Mm-hmm. Definitely. I think the, the idea behind this is very much also to pick up the many threads that have been uh, developed uh, towards these questions already in, 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 yeah, not only the last years, I would say the last decades. I mean, uh, many people who have been actually very important in the development of this digital environment have been voicing at very early stages already uh, that they are afraid of uh, the problems that we have right now. And as we talked before, many, many artists have portrayed in very clear images and stories that uh, uh, humanity will, or our society, let's say like this, our societies will very soon kind of drown in this uh, in this mud of over-connectivity and over-communication and then all these kind of things. So basically it is just a call to uh, get reasonable. Uh, I mean, that's <laughs> the very uh, <laughs> simplest and basic things that, that, that we can say. It, it, it's not a call, so to say, to stop technology. It's not a call to say, okay, enough of internet, let's cut the lines. Uh, because I think that just would be stupid, that's not uh, possible and not even desirable. Uh, I mean, we always have to see that, of course, in just when we look at the last 30 years, uh, since uh, uh, we have things like uh, the World Wide Web available, I mean, the the living conditions of so many people have also become better. Uh, What we just need to do and this sounds so simple and is, of course, so incredibly difficult. It says that they just get reasonable and uh, develop ways to apply this technology, these tools to make it available in a, a little bit more 
fairer way, in a little bit more uh, reasonable way that it benefits. I, I would not even dare to say that it benefits all of us. It's already enough if, if it benefits a little bit more of us. I mean, we are so super focused uh, on a super small uh, minority of people who are really benefiting and controlling this digital world. Um, what we see when we look at the digital world is really a completely a super strong new digital feudalism. It's a few private people who own all the territory. I mean, it's like the old kings a uh, thousand years ago. Uh, they were not only own, owning the land, but uh, they also owned legally in their legal systems. It was completely legal that they owned every person living on their land and having every right to decide about their lives. I mean, we spent hundreds of years or even more to fight against it. And finally, uh, maybe only about 100 years ago or so, we succeeded to get rid of this uh, super stupid system. And suddenly, uh, while we only start to enjoy something like equal, free individual uh, uh, beings, at least in a certain part of our world, in a very small part of the world, we throw it away and we hand over our digital bodies and our digital existence now to these digital landlords. And it's just incredible, uh, stupid to do this. So it, it's on the one side a wake up call for everybody just to stand up and say, well, I mean, just to have the fun to exchange the photos of my cats with all my friends, I don't need to give up my human rights, my human dignity. And I think even more so, it is also a wake up call uh, to politics and business as well, because we only will succeed also in a commercial uh, way in this digital world if we are able to establish trust systems. Without trust, you cannot make business. There is a certain period in, in every development, this is like this Wild West thing where the cowboy rides into town and if he's the fastest to pull his gun, he owns the town. And this is exactly <laughs> the way how internet companies uh, and ID companies have been working in the last 30 years. Who was faster in shooting, won the race and that's it. Okay, fine, that's maybe the way how it has to work. But now we have to come to the next step. So it's also a call for civilization of this new digital world. And of course, civilization uh, is an important keyword here, especially with the brackets, because it is easy to call for rules and regulations and customs inside this digital world. But in difference to all the hundred years before, we have now to consider much more this question of whose rules, whose guiding lines, whose opinion of good life should we introduce? And this was difficult enough in the whole history of mankind, but now with uh, not only this very big global spread, but also with this very, and uh, unfortunately, it's still three major power centers. United States, China, and Europe still is a, is a power center. We still have opportunities to introduce some of the, and that's of course a very difficult uh, discussion that we have to have to lead uh, and, 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 and to make, in how far should we introduce what we call European values? I mean, is this even, you know, can we even, without being immediately thrown out of the room, talk about European values when we talk about, uh, uh, so to say, uh, a, a new, whether you call it social deal or new digital, de uh, digital deal, it's actually, it is about a social deal. And it will not be one social deal, we will need hundreds and thousands of social deals. Uh, and one of the very big question is uh, how we will be able to deal with this absolute requirement of diversity. I think this is even of, of the many things that are new to us. All the digital stuff is new to us, the uh, climate, uh, climate uh, change thing and uh, all the, the artificial intelligence and the biotechnology. So we have many new challenges, yeah. but the absolute requirement of respect to diversity 
is in cultural terms probably the biggest challenge that we have to face as society. Mm -hmm. And again, I think this is something where only if we work together with artists, if we listen to artists, if we introduce their perspectives and their way of reflecting uh, reality, then we have a chance to get to this point because we need in one way or another, we need to harmonize uh, the humanistic part whatever this term might mean and however it will uh, be defined, we need to uh, harmonize humanity with uh, all these uh, technological developments and yeah. the impact of technological development. Hey, uh, Geoffrey, uh, this is, the, we could go <laughs> on and, and discussing yeah. this. It has been a, a real pleasure. I think we have to leave it here, but uh, on my uh, note, togetherness, uh, yeah, the, the challenges of di diversity is really interesting topic as well, <laughs> and um, and 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 many other ideas that are worth it, uh, reflection. So I'm very much looking forward to the next Arts Electronica and and to the Facil, uh, uh, festival as well in Salamanca. I'm hoping to continue these conversations elsewhere in different platforms with you and with uh, everyone in the community and, uh, and the audience. And I, I, I thank you again. And uh, thank you to, to the team of um, FACIL, who is behind the recording. And I hope to catch up at some point very soon. Yeah. Hey. Likewise, thank you very much. And thanks to the people of FACIL Festival and good luck with their event. Thank you. Bye, Geoffrey. Bye. Bye.